Chester Bennington, lead singer of Lincoln Park, he took his own life seven months ago today. This song, it's called One More Light. It's the title track to the band's latest studio album released just a couple months before his death. The song was written about losing someone you love, in particular, a friend of the band who had died of cancer. And so it's speaking about losing that person and showing that you care. But I, you can't get into the mind of someone who's, who's suicidal. You never know what they're thinking. Um, if you, even if the, you did, it wouldn't make sense. But I can't help but think that in the last weeks of his life, as he was performing this song, in the lyrics, who cares if one more light goes out? Who cares if someone's time runs out? Was he thinking about himself and thinking that no one cared if his light went out or no one cared if his time ran out? Chester's suicide was one of about 45,000 that took place in the United States last year. And by the grace of God, there weren't 45,001. Uh, let me tell you about my story. The first time I ever suffered depression was in high school, the first year of high school. I was very severely depressed. Um, it would be what they would have called at the time clinical depression. I was never treated or diagnosed. Um, it had very profound effects on my life. My grades plummeted from A's to pretty much. Okay, I won't do that anymore. Um, and you know, nothing was done about it. You know, my, my parents knew something was going on. You know, the teachers at school knew something was going on. And other students, friends, um, they knew something was going on. Um, but by the end of the year, I came out of it. Uh, and I don't really fault anybody at the time. I mean, this was the mid-90s. Treating depression wasn't as much of a thing, and certainly not for a 15-year-old. Um, but like I said, by the end of the year, I came out of the depression, and I was completely different. Um, the next time depression really hit was in college. And I would have periods of depression on and off, and they would come and go. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, I don't have anything to be depressed about. Why am I depressed? Because in college, I was having lots of fun. It was good fun, clean fun. Um, but I had friends that I never had before. I had this community, and, and I was still wondering, why am I depressed? But, you know, depression doesn't always have to have a trigger. You know, sometimes, you know, there's financial problems, a death, a divorce, uh, sometimes chemicals, sometimes alcohol could cause it. But sometimes it just happens. And that's what went on with me. It just happened. Uh, and during one of the periods of depression in college is the first time that I had contemplated suicide. I did go so far as to abort a suicide attempt. What really kept me from going through with it was knowing that I'm an only child and my parents wouldn't have another kid to love if I was gone. So that kept me going. Now, after college, for the next 12 or 13 years, I was pretty much depression-free. I don't recall any memorable periods of depression in that amount of time. Um, and in those 12 or 13 years, I got married to a beautiful woman, have two little girls, went back to school a couple times, because like I said, I enjoyed it. Um, ended up landing here in Memphis, the city I love. And uh, so everything external in my life was, was going pretty good until the fall of 2016. And one day I was in my office at the house, I work at home, and it was one morning, I think it was a Wednesday, I got depressed, like very suddenly. I was like, this is strange. Um, I just got depressed. Hmm. And I knew what the feeling was. I knew what it was instantly. And 
I wasn't too concerned because I said, like, well, it'll come and go. That's what it always had before. And in fact, there was a, a group of about four or five guys that um, from our church, and we met up every other week or so just to kind of do life together, just to talk about what's going on in our lives, where we need prayer, where we need accountability. And I texted the guys and I said, hey guys, pray for me, I've just got depressed. But don't worry too much because it'll, after a while it'll go away. But it was different this time. It got really bad, really fast. Uh, I had never experienced such a deep depression. It was, you know, I would, I would cry for no reason, seemingly. Um, one time I was in Walmart shopping and I started crying. I'm like, could you not wait till I got out to the car or something? Uh, you know, it, it was it was very, very dark and I knew that it was different in some regards, but I didn't know what to do about it. I'd never had any kind of treatment or anything about it before. But after a few weeks, I got desperate. I got desperate for relief because I had, it had been weeks since I had felt good. I had felt down for so long. And I was in my office at the house and I had an idea. I realized that there was something that could relieve the mental pain of my depression. And so I walked back to our bedroom and to our bathroom and I opened the cabinet and there was a bottle of prescription opioid pain medication. Actually, there were two bottles. And I said, if I take one of those, it will relieve my depression. And so I did. And I went back to my office and I started crying. That's what you do when you're depressed. But I, I did it because I knew what I had just done. I had just gotten on the fast train to addiction because I knew myself I knew that there would be another. It would not stop at that one. I knew that the next day I was going to take another, and the next, another, and the next, another, and so on. And sure enough, that's what I did. It be, from that day one, it became a daily habit of getting out of bed, being excited to start my work day so I could go in my office and take a couple pills and get high. Now, I told my friends, the, these four or five guys that I was close to, I kind of told them what was going on. I told them I was depressed. I told them about the pills, and I said, guys, I think I might have a problem with pills. And, and one of my buddies, he's a very soft-spoken dude, but the, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he looked at me and he said, you get rid of those pills. You flush them, you throw them away now. And I looked at him, and I said, I, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't. And I told him, actually, I said, but don't worry, guys. I'll quit when I run out. <laughs> Laughter. Come on. <laughs> Every addict has said that. Um, which is interesting because I knew I was developing this addiction. I knew that I, can't, I couldn't live without them. I, just, I didn't have an end game. Like, you, you know, when you're in that state, you don't think that far ahead. But it wasn't long after that that I made the decision that I was going to take my own life. I felt like I was, I was worthless. Um, I even felt, sometimes I would skip meals because I felt it was a waste of good food for somebody like me to eat it. I felt like I was a burden to my wife and kids and my friends as well. I thought that everybody would be better off without me. I, I, I thought that my wife and, and little girls, that after my funeral, they would go home smiling and happy that I was gone. Um, I, I would have daydreams about my wife remarrying a man who could be the husband I couldn't be and the dad that I could never be. And I would think about them going on dates and I would see her smiling and laughing and him playing with my girls in the backyard and how happy they looked. And that made me happy knowing that if I committed suicide, it would bring joy to them. 
And I believed it. Um, and I told my friends that. And of, and of course they were like, you know, that's insane. That's crazy. But the thing is, when you're depressed, it affects the way you think. You can't think rationally and logically. You can when you're not sick. So I, I had made the decision I was going to in my own life. Now, it was approaching the holidays at the end of 2016, and I'd always heard that committing suicide over the holidays around that time is a pretty bad time to do it. Um, and so we had, you know, when we had plans to travel to go see family over the Christmas break, and I said, okay, I'll do it the first week of January. We're back in town when the girls start school. When they're at school during the day, away from the house, that's when I will go out elsewhere and in my life. And I started to get scared because I was having suicidal impulses and I knew I was powerless to control them. And one of my buddies, you know, and my friends, they didn't know the severity of the situation. Um, they didn't know the crisis, the, the depths of the crisis I was in. And one of my friends had been telling me that I need to tell my wife. And see, she didn't know anything. She didn't even know I was depressed. I'd walk out of my office in the house, smile on my face, hey, honey, what's for lunch? Sometimes I was high. But uh, she didn't suspect a thing and I didn't want her to know because I felt so burdensome I felt like it, she you know I'm terrible enough as I am it's just one more thing for have to, her to have to deal with and I don't want her, her to have to go through that but my friend he told me he's like you got to tell your wife you got to tell your wife and I got to the point to where I realized I was unable to control the impulses and I got scared that I was gonna commit suicide not according to my plan and I realized that she was going to have to be the one to stop me. And so one Friday night, kids were in bed. I spent a couple hours mustering the courage. And I walked into the kitchen and I said, I, I've been depressed and I need help. She asked me if I was suicidal and I said, yeah. And she said, okay, we'll get you help. And that put the wheels in motion to get treatment. Uh, not a week later, um, I was in a doctor's office and a psychiatrist. Um, this was the first step toward my treatment, was this appointment with this doctor. And I told him everything was going on, and he said, you've got textbook case of major depressive disorder. And he starts talking about treatment options and medications. And I said, doc, there's one more thing. I'm using opioid pills. And his tone changed a little bit because this doctor also is a specialist in addiction. And he asked me how many, how often, for how long. And he said, you're on the cusp of a full-blown chemical addiction. You're just like a couple weeks away. And he explained to me what that was going to look like. And I did tell him, too, that I was going to quit when I ran out. And he said, no, you'll, you'll get more. And he said, actually, what's going to happen is you are going to run out. And you'll find more, but you're going to find that it's hard to get those pills now. So what you're going to turn to instead is heroin, because heroin and oxycodone is pretty much the same thing. Uh, and then he told me what happens when you start on heroin, you either end up in very expensive, painful treatment, or he said you'll be dead. And I believed him. I knew that was the truth, that I was on the road to death. And so then, the, and there in his office, I said, okay, I'm done with the pills. I'm done. And the next day, I flushed him down the toilet. And that day, you know, that day in his office, that's the day that I consider my recovery date. It was December 21st, 2016. And I do it for two reasons. One, because that's the day I first started seeking treatment for depression, and it's also the day that I stopped using the pills. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I didn't know, and then the people in my life did not know, is what is, what is treatment for depression? What does it look like? So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what I my treatment. 
So I went to a psychiatrist for medications. I started going to a therapist every week, which is a psychologist or a licensed clinical social worker or somebody of that nature. Um, I go to celebrate recovery every Thursday. It, there's something very therapeutic about being in the presence of people that have had the same experiences that are not wearing masks. Our problems are right there for everybody to see. And to be in like an open share group, and I can say, guys, this week has been terrible. My depression is overcoming me this week, and I can't handle it. And knowing that there's guys in that room that know exactly what that feels like. Because if you've never struggled with depression, you really don't know what it's like. It's not just being sad. Um, and that's okay that you don't know. Uh, just don't pretend to know. So... I go to CR, and, and then part of the greater point of that is the community. I have put myself into a community of other people in various stages of recovery for different things so that we are very real with each other. I have friends that where every time I see them in church, at the gym, or we're calling each other up or whatever, and we say, how are you doing? We mean, how are you doing? Don't tell me about the weather. I need to know how you're doing. And being in that community of people that have struggled with depression and know exactly what's going on when I say I'm not doing good. And the other part of, of treatment is you can't forget the spiritual component of it. You know, when I was in the, in the depths of the depression, I didn't really think much about God. I didn't really think that he cared much about me. But, you know, I want to let you know that, you know, you aren't worthless. You have worth. You have worth to God. Even if you think everybody on this planet thinks you're worthless, he thinks you have value and he loves you. And the thing to remember is that he loves you not because of who you are, but because of who he is. No matter what you do or could have had done to you or what you think about yourself, he doesn't love you any less. That is what I consider the holistic treatment that I get from my depression. And treatment is a journey. There's no quick fix, there's no quick cure, there's no pill that's gonna wipe away your depression and you'll just be fine and dandy for the rest of your life. It is a journey, but it works. Treatment works. Now for any of y'all that, that may be suffering from depression, and particularly if any of you have not sought help or treatment, the three most important words are, I need help. I waited almost too long. It was almost too late when I said those three words. You go to someone and you tell them you need help. And when I told my wife, she didn't know what treatment looked like either. But she picked up the phone and called someone who didn't know to help me start that journey of recovery. Now, for those of you who maybe don't suffer from depression, but you might know someone who does. Like I said earlier, you don't really know what it's like if you've never been there, and that's okay. That's okay. And there's a few things you don't want to say to the person. You know, you don't want to minimize what they're going through. You, you, you don't say, ah, oh, just everybody gets sad every once in a while. Ah, oh, you'll snap out of it. Come on, you know, let's just go out, have some fun, take your mind off of it. You'll be all right. Or, you know, hey, you've got nothing to be depressed about. Why are you depressed? Don't have a clue. But there's a few things that you do need to say. And, and really first, I'll say it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask, are you depressed? If they say yes, then ask them, have you thought about suicide? 
And if they say yes, then say, do you have a plan? If they say yes, say, say, tell me about your plan. And the more details they tell you about your plan, their plan, the more worried you should be. And once you've initiated that conversation, there's, there's five things that I think are, are very important that need to be said to the person. And the first one is the most important. And you need to say it with conviction and you need to look at the person in their eye and you say, you are loved. You are loved. Tell them that you are there for them. I am here for you. And you know what? Treatment works. Treatment works. It's a journey, but treatment works. I will get you help. And the fifth one, you mean it. You say this one also with conviction, and you say, and I will walk with you every step of the journey. Never leave you. And that means you don't leave that person. You call them, you text them, you drive them to appointments, but you stay in their life and walk with them through that journey. The song that we started out with, the video, yeah, I think about the lyrics. It, it starts out with, should have stayed where there's signs I ignored. Can I help you not to hurt anymore? And then it continues on. Who cares if one more light goes out? Who cares if someone's time runs out? And I tell you the truth is, I care. We all here in this room care. And he cares. And I'll leave you with this. You are loved. Thank you.